but I believe that it has ultimately an impact on our lives because decisions that come from judges do uh, condition our lives and do take, take uh, us in a particular direction or prevent us from taking a particular direction. And therefore, let's do a, a fundamental exercise about how judges decide cases. There are two, and every time I say how they decide cases, uh, please read that as, or hear that as, how they ought to, how they must decide cases. And largely, we are talking about, for the present, about the constitutional context, but this would apply to any form of conflict of opinion, any form of contestation or any form of disagreement about rights that people have or competing claims and rights amongst people. But broadly speaking, constitutional adjudication, how should it work? Now let's take some simple propositions. Let's take a proposition about the difference between a parliamentarian in parliament taking a particular view to create or legislate fresh law, which is what the purpose of parliament is. Parliament spends uh, very little time, if um, perhaps no time at all, on deciding what rights people have. But parliament does spend most of its time in deciding what rights have. Now, it's all done within the context of the constitution that is larger or above, as it were, above parliament. Constitution itself has established parliament and therefore parliament must adhere to constitutional principles and constitutional allocation of entitlements between different institutions. Therefore, to that extent, it may be that parliament reflects upon what rights people have, including what rights Parliament have, has. But generally, Parliament works on creating rights. Uh, it may do so on grounds of ideology. It may do so on grounds of public opinion. It may do so on grounds of, uh, of successful politics. It may do so on grounds of uh, public opinion. Uh, it may do so on grounds of what they perceive, parliamentarians perceive, is good for the country uh, and it's good for the purpose that they are to serve as parliamentarians. Now, this is one proposition about how parliamentarians would take a view and uh, allocate entitlements, allocate rights, and, and, uh, and take a position about, about possible potential or existing conflicts. They sometimes decide existing conflicts by taking one view or the other. They sometimes decide on what future rights people will have. Therefore, any future contestation or conflict would be decided. That's what parliament does. Now, if we ask ourselves, is this what, is this what happens with, with courts as well? Do courts decide on any of these principles, public opinion, uh, on ideology, on, uh, uh, and when I say ideology, it's not like a larger constitutional ideology, but a limited ideology of the kind that political parties can be said to have into their day-to-day -day -day functioning. Would a court decide a matter in that manner, or would the court really decide it in a different way? So that's one set of questions that we need to answer before we come to a final conclusion what uh, adjudication is about. Another question that uh, we might ask ourselves is because we know superficially one important instrument, uh, one instrument that is used uh, very, very uh, frequently by judges and certainly constitutional judges is, is uh, stare decisis or precedence. Whatever has been decided in the past, that is to be continued, that is to be adhered to, that is to be followed, unless, as in some systems now, certainly in our own system, there is now a good reason to depart from a position that's been taken in the past. So, 
If there was a position in the past on constitutional amendments, pre Keshavnan Bharati uh, position that you could amend the constitution to any extent that you wanted. And then came Keshavnan Bharati, and Keshavnan Bharati says, no, we are overruling Golaknath. You cannot amend, you cannot amend beyond a certain point. And that point or that barricade, as it were, is the barricade called basic structure. The basic structure doctrine. You can't tamper with the constitution. You can't amend the constitution in such a way that the constitution becomes a different constitution. And therefore, you must secure the basic structure that is found in the constitution. Now, there are many other philosophical, philosophical questions about that. But the, the functional position is that since Keshav Nan Bharti, amendments have now an inherent restriction that amendments of the constitution must be restricted by the doctrine of Keshav Nan Bharti. So that's the second question. Now, nothing of this nature applies to parliament. If parliament wants to change the law fundamentally, there is no problem. It can amend the law fundamentally. You will just have a new law in the place of old law. But parliament cannot do this with the constitution, as I said, because of Keshav Nan Bharti. So there are restrictions on parliament as far as the constitution is concerned, but there are no restrictions on parliament as far as the law is concerned, other than constitutional law, to be able to change the law, as long as it does not violate the Keshav Nan Bharti doctrine. Now, the third thing that we look at, the third question or dimension is that people, all of us, have preferences. We have inherent preferences. We have intuitive preferences. We have uh, educated preferences. Uh, we, have, we are influenced by the society we live in. We are influenced by the kind of education we have been, we have been given. We are influenced by family traditions. We are influenced by what we have been taught as a child. We are influenced by people we admire. We are influenced by whatever we see in the media, whatever we read, whatever we experience as a person. And that becomes a very strong personal preference. Now, when we would take a decision, we would take a decision in terms of strong personal preferences. People who've thought seriously would take prefer preferential positions or personal preferential positions based on serious insight or serious thought or internal analysis. Those who haven't done much thinking but are just influenced by trends, who are influenced by advertising, who are influ influenced by pictures, who are influenced by storytelling of somebody, etc., would also have a personal preference but that personal preference would be a very, almost an arbitrary personal preference because it wouldn't have gone through serious analysis. So that again is a very, very important factor. So please keep that, please keep that in mind, the difference between how parliament operates and, and how a judge operates. This has been, this, what I've suggested to you, has been examined very carefully, and very deeply by a, a great legal philosopher, Ronald Dawkin, who passed away a couple of years ago, who was my, my teacher in, in Oxford, and who as the professor of jurisprudence succeeded a all time great called HLA Hart. He was a student of HLA Hart and then actually stepped into HLA Hart's shoes as the there's the uh, professor of jurisprudence. And his lecture, his first lecture, the inaugural lecture, was called Hard Cases. And it finally published it in the form of a book. And that book provides the thesis, which is called the Rights Thesis. And Hard Cases, we are familiar as lawyers, are cases in which there is no easy answer. When we go out into court and we argue something, there are certain cases on which you may not get relief the way you expect or anticipate, but your instincts tell you, your training tells you, your experience tells you that this is what you're likely to get in this case. 
because judges and lawyers belong to the same kind of intellectual process and lawyers can anticipate what a judge will probably do. But it sometimes turns out to be different. And then you need to investigate and you will need to inquire why the intellectual process has taken the judge in a different direction. Now, that's the kind of case that Walken described as a hard case. And the expression, as we know as lawyers, is that hard cases make bad law. And the reason is that hard cases are so difficult to decide, so difficult to decide, that you can, despite being outstanding, you can make a mistake. Now, what Ronald Walken did was to, to ex expand on his thesis, on his rights thesis, on the idea of how judges decide cases, how cases uh, are subjected to in a particular form of analysis, uh, keeping in mind the three, three possible differences between, between legislators and judges, uh, adjudicators, uh, he, found, he found a distinct distinction between two kinds of considerations. This reflects what I have just placed before you, but to, to improve on, on my analysis, let me just take and borrow from Ronald Dworkin's analysis, where Ronald Dworkin says, there are two ways to decide a set of facts or set of, set of claims or counterclaims. One is on grounds of policy and one is on grounds of principle. Now policy is what is applied by a parliamentarian. What is a good policy? If we have more speech and free internet, would there be, would there be greater good for our country? Or if we restrict free speech, at least to the extent of uh, lowering the speeds that are available in disturbed parts of India, and this is a matter that we argued before on online before the Supreme Court today, but we still have to await a judgment. But there is, there is Anuradha, uh, Anuradha Bhasin judgment in which section 144, restrictions on in the public space and restrictions on the internet has been considered as being fundamental to democracy, fundamental as a right of, of, uh, of citizens under Article 19, but subject, of course, to reasonable restrictions that 19.2 provides. Now, when you look at something, something of this nature, you're looking at policy. Is this good policy? If we chose to do this, what would be the consequence? People would be happier, people would be miserable, people would, be, would accept it, people would not accept it, and that's how policy considerations are considered. But can a judge do that? Can a judge sit there and try and figure out directly or indirectly in some manner or the other whether a decision given in a particular way is likely to improve things or is it likely to ruin things for people? Would it bring about greater happiness amongst people or will it less, lessen the sense of security and happiness amongst people? Now, although this is a possible consideration, but it cannot be a conclusive consideration for a judge because the judge is not deciding the matter in terms of a policy. It's, in, it's relevant to the extent that when there is a very, very, very uh, close choice between yes and no, then a judge may say, well, I could go either one way or the other way. There isn't really that much of a difference between the two, but going one way, tilting towards yes will create greater happiness, tilting towards no will create greater misery. And therefore, I will tilt towards yes. Now, there may be a prima facie on the surface, such an analysis available, which is very similar to a policy-based analysis. For instance, restricting knowledge, restricting the way people communicate with each other, restricting people's ability to say things which are perhaps different from what other people believe, which is what freedom of expression, freedom of dissent, 
freedom of disagreement is all about. Now, in each of these cases, the decision that is taken may act to improve things, it may act not to improve things. Let's take an example. When the Supreme Court upheld the ban on, on, on a book like, uh, uh, like uh, a, a book, book like, like uh, Satanic Verses, a lot of people thought that was interference with free speech. Some people may have been happy, some people may have been, may, may have been happy, but uh, some people believe that this was interference with their self-esteem and it was interference with the respect they had for their own religion and figures of their religion. But many people thought that we must have greater freedom and merely because there is something that somebody finds unpleasant or unwelcome or unbecoming doesn't necessarily mean that uh, we should we should impose restrictions on it i mean that becomes a very 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 critical critical decision between two kinds two kinds of people we are in some questions in between no not yet okay then, then uh, uh, let's look at a book called Lady Chatterley's Lover. Now, Lady Chatterley's Lover was banned in many countries, and it was it was banned in our country as well. And Lady Chatterley's Lover, it was great judges like Justice Justice Sadayatullah went on to become Chief Justice. Great judges then expounded on Lady Chatterley's Lover, talked about literature, talked about philosophy, but at the end of the day said that the restrictions imposed on Lady Chatterley's lover were justified. Now that may remain on the law books, that may remain as part, as part of the law of our country, but we know, we know with passage of time, how much that has changed. That book is today looked at as a fine piece of literature, a book that was once banned. There are less ideological, there are less sentimental positions involved here. Uh, as there was in Satanic Verses, and therefore it's, it's easier to take up an example like Lady Chatterley's Lover to understand how judges then were perhaps either looking at policy, not at principle, in deciding to allow the ban, or they were looking at principle but inadequately, and we'll come to the principle issue a little bit later. Similarly, let's ask ourselves as to what has happened in the Nas Foundation case. Is it between the High Court and the Supreme Court first judgment and then this, the, the, the second judgment? Is it that they are applying a matter of policy? Are they saying that now by accepting the proposition that decriminalization of same-sex relations which are consensual is better for our society, makes our society, improves our society, or did they in the past believe that it was bad for the society and therefore they didn't approve it. And therefore such matters that came up to the high courts till Justice A.P. Shah was finally able to strike down the criminal provision was, uh, uh, was seen by the high courts, not just in our country, but in many countries as being necessary to protect morality of the country. Is that a matter of policy or perceived policy? Or is that a matter of principle? I would argue that the change that has happened and the attitude towards such cases is not a change in change of policy, but is, in a, is a change of judges gradually migrating from, from policy to principle. So when the LGBTQ case finally gets decided by the Supreme Court in the time of Justice uh, Deepak Mishra, it is decided on certain principles, not on mere policy, policy parameters. But when it was, it was earlier decided, it was decided, I believe, on policy parameters. But is that clear enough in our judgments or not is the big question that is of much interest to us. So you've got the principle, uh, the principle policy differentiation that Gorkin makes. Policy is something that relates to something that is popular, 
something that adds to the good of the people, something that adds to an object, object that is to be preferred by certain people in, gov in governance, etc. But a principle is something quite different. There may be elements of policy in a principle decision, but only elements. The dominant role has to be of principle. And what is the dominant role of principle? The dominant role of principle has to deal with something called institutional morality. Now, please get a fix on the difference between policy and principle, the difference between a legislative act and an adjudicative act, and now finally a difference between morality and institutional morality. Morality, like a policy area, is very simple. It's like um, a way of life, a sense of, of a conduct of and behavior that in society is seen by way of uh, largest number of people accepting it and behaving in that manner. But it's again more than descriptive. Morality has a lot to do with something being prescriptive, being normative. So when you behave in a particular manner, if in a particular religion you do not smoke, it is not because you say smoking is bad or it's bad for your health. You do it because you believe smoke, smoking is bad per se. Smoking is not good for a human being. And that may be true about people who are vegetarians who believe that taking life is bad per se. They don't decide whether I take life will be bad for our society. And if I don't take life, it will be good for our society. That's not how they analyze it. They just instinctively, normatively believe bound by the very idea that life is sacrosanct and you cannot interfere with life. You must preserve and you must protect life. Somebody else, somebody else may decide that Animals are actually made for the good of human beings, that we are the superior race and we have the right or the superior breed of, of life and we have a right to extract for ourselves such proteins and such nutrients as we can get from animals. Now, that's a very, very, very interesting area of the study of uh, how a race of human beings can be racist in the sense or a species in the sense of considering themselves per se superior to other species. And the way between one human race and another human race, people are, are labeled as being racist in, in, in the case of one species versus another species, uh, for instance, between, between human beings and, uh, and, and animals uh, that, are, that are culled for the table, it is, a uh, species another versus another species being being almost like a species uh, believing yourself to be superior. But that's for another day when the courts may have to consider this. So let's get back for a moment to what is institutional morality. Now, morality can be observed. You can go out into the streets and know somebody wants to cover their head. Uh, or some people cover their head only when they visit places of worship or places that are sacred. Or you might, you might think that people speak in a particular manner. Uh, they are obsequious or they are careful or they're obedient, all depending on what the social system requires them to do. Now, many people who rebel against social systems talk about this being oppressive. Many people believe that if you break the conduct, the, the process of, of, of uh, accepting certain conduct as social conduct, then society itself will break. And that's the kind of thing that we saw in the hippie movement when hippies defied moral, moral codes of, of ordinary society and people felt that society under was, was itself under threat. But uh, the, uh, the hippie movement felt that, that society was uh, being so oppressive to itself and its ind individual members that there was need for a fundamental change. And that change was to be, bring in, was to be brought in by flower power 
by uh, chanting for peace and living your life through different different levels of morality but all this is not law it there may be public pressure there may be social pressure but this is not law and therefore we are taught when we first become law students that there is difference between law and morality morality can be converted into law by parliament morality can be converted converted into something more binding through the institutions of the country not just necessarily through social mores and through to to social boycotts etc but morality is not law by itself similarly law is different from morality when you make law and you say you function in this manner it may be in support of my of morality it may actually be in defiance of morality let's take an example if a law is made by parliament if a law is made by parliament that men that that men only can go to sabri mala through a, at a particular time and that women of certain ages are not allowed to go if that is if that is a law made by parliament then the question will be is parliament trying to follow morality if such a law is made through a court judgment as indeed as indeed it has been made through a court judgment then the question will be is the court trying to follow morality but by itself by itself it was not law it had to be converted into law either by parliament or had to be converted into law by by the constitutional court of the country now of course this is an open question this is still to be heard by a larger bench so i'm only taking this as an example not not necessarily expressing my opinion one way or the other but keep in mind keep in mind that this judgment was based on an interesting concept called constitutional morality i spoke on that only two days ago and we'll come to that in a moment but morality as you see in the streets as you can perhaps gather through public opinions through through public surveys is different is different from law law is to be found in the judgments of the courts law is to be found in the books uh, in the statute books etc morality is to be found outside morality can be found in uh, uh, in opinion polls it can be found in surveys done by people it can be done it can be done by by uh, uh, looking at 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 uh, media uh, media indication or media trends it can be seen in many ways but it's different from law now when we say that in law something that's written that's printed that's passed by parliament or that's said in the constitution gives you an answer that's only in those cases where such an answer is clearly available there will be times when that answer will become a little obscure a little difficult to pinpoint and there are thousands of such occasions i mean we know what article 14 is article 14 is simple right to equality but what is right what is equality has been debated over and over again is equality is an absolute equality is equality an equality of opportunity is equality is an is is an equality of outcome is equality to be to be uh, uh, factored with with the disadvantage over the years or over the generations that somebody has suffered and therefore reverse discrimination or what we call affirmative action becomes necessary these are all questions of what is equality so even if it looks very easy to say well equality is equality but and some people might say that equality is what you see like forrest gump would say stupid is what stupid does equality is what equality seems then it will be a simple answer for you but in order to give a answer that is acceptable to a large number of people in order to give an answer that would would mean uh, something sustainable something on which governments can act there has to be a deeper analysis of what is equality and therefore 
can we simply borrow from public perception, from public morality, and decide what equality is? Shall we look at trends that people believe what is equal? Shall we look at, look at the propositions of policy as to what would lead to greater happiness in our society? And also to look at policy that greater happiness is necessarily good and less happiness is necessarily bad. How will all this be decided? Now, what the Supreme Court has done is that Supreme Court has introduced the concept of constitutional morality. But before we get to constitutional morality, I would argue that we look at institutional morality. So there is a popular morality. You can tell, you can tell out in the streets how people behave at home, who smokes, who doesn't smoke, who touches his parents' feet, his elder's feet, who doesn't touch his elder's feet, who wears what kind of clothes, who wears what kind of food. All that is to do with our social moral behavior. It may have sanctions imposed by society. It may not have sanctions imposed by society, but certainly can't have sanctions imposed by institutions of law, by the police, by the courts, unless it's converted into a law. Now, conversion into a law by parliament makes sense but only to the extent that that conversion is not questioned by court and questioned under the constitutional constraints that are imposed. Or it is converted into law by a court judgment itself, but the court judgment then must look at something more. It can't simply say, I will look at morality and accept it. So what does the court have to look at? The court, according to Ronald Dworkin, has to look at institutional morality. Now, this is either a very, very, very deep thought, or this is something that you might all think is, well, this is something I've known all my life as a lawyer. So let's examine it. What is institutional morality? Now, when, when the court decides, as it may decide sometimes in future, that the restriction placed, the restriction placed on Lady Chatterley's lover was wrong, and as I said, you can't do it, you can't do it by, uh, by just looking at policy, although policy, as I said, can sometimes influence these decisions. The court will have to look at what is the nature, what is the nature of the thought processes reflected in institutional decisions of our, of our society to decide whether the kind of material and the text that we find in Lady Chatterley's Lover is something undesirable, unwholesome, and requires to be restricted? Or is our institutional history, our institutional history, a history that says you should allow for this freedom? So now, if we are looking at very specific example, if we are looking at sexual behavior, for instance, or we are looking at, at, uh, at personal relations, for instance, would the institutional history of our country go back and look at what we have known by way of treatises in the past, like Kama Sutra and other treatises that would suggest what our institutional approach was to personal relations? Would it be, would it be uh, relevant or in, in, in relevant, in, irrelevant considerations? When we think about freedom, when we think about freedom of expression, we need to go back to pristine times of institutional history of our land, not only judgments of the last 10, 15, 20, 50 years, not, in, not just the judgments that we got from the, from the House of Lords or the, or the English judges, which sometimes uh, we cite and we use to fortify our arguments in one area or another, but that we would go back to institutional history when we speak in lay terms and in general ter terms about India's or the Hindustani or Bhartiya credo, when we talk about what it means to be Indian, when we talk about what it means to be Bhartiya, we have to go through back to our institutional positions that we would have taken at different times and come to a conclusion about what cherished beliefs we have. 
a very difficult area, very, very difficult area, for instance, and that's the area of, that's the area of life. Um, and it, it's been considered by the Supreme Court uh, several times, uh, constitutional benches have considered whether the right to life that the courts have, have gloriously developed under Article 21 should in any way reflect upon the law as far as death sentence is concerned, uh, as far as the capital punishment is concerned. Now, we thought that we came very close to, close to, uh, the law came pretty close to accepting propositions that more than 110 countries in the world accept, that the state has or society has no right to take life. Uh, simply because and merely because somebody has committed murder, you cannot, you cannot uh, take the position that they deserve to be executed. Now, the closest that we've come to this is when the Supreme Court has taken the view that it's only in rarest of rare cases, rarest of rare cases in the English language, perhaps uh, quite, a, uh, quite a new formulation, but only in rarest of rare cases can a person be executed in a case of murder. And of course, they've laid down the grounds uh, of how the rarest of rare cases, is, cases are decided. The latest amongst them are added to by uh, certain, certain really, really uh, horrible and unwholesome behavior of adults with children or with women, or certainly of people who do, uh, who attack the country and attract, attract our citizens of our country for uh, reasons that are completely, completely unacceptable to us and uh, uh, which, which essentially are reasons of terrorism. Now, there is much talk about, about uh, uh, amplifying rarest of rare cases, uh, but I think one day the court will once again examine whether the rarest of rare cases should survive or should not survive, given that most countries in the world don't believe in death sentence anymore. And when we look at death sentence, would we not examine, would we not examine what the standard approach to death has been of institutions in our country going back thousands of years? It doesn't have to be only 50 years. It doesn't have to be only 100 years. And that's the question. Now, again, just put back, go back for a moment to the propositions that I gave you. Are we going to just look at the court is going to say, what do people want? Do people want death? We'll give death in these cases. Now, I think that's an inadequate, inadequate adjudication. Or would they say, what is the policy to be followed? What would be good? If we, if we impose death, there will be less crime or uh, there will be more crime if we impose death. Now, there are arguments which run both ways and not enough data is available for us to say conclusively and with complete confidence that one particular view is the view that would, would prevail in terms of, of policy. But obviously, by, by taking a decision and waiting five years or 10 years and collecting data, we might come to some, some conclusions. So that's not available. What is available to us is institutionally, how have we looked at death? How have we struggled against death sentence? Why is it that we have cut it down from death sentence per se to death sentence only in rarest or rare cases? Is that based on um, uh, a sentimental approach? Is it based on aesthetics? Is it based on some idea of morality? Is it based on something to do with afterlife and not having a right to take life, etc., etc.? Many of those questions will arise, but institutionally, how do we feel? As far as popular morality is concerned, after a horrific crime is committed, if you went out into the streets and asked what should happen to the people, they would inevitably say they should be hanged. They should be immediately, immediately put to death. Sometimes even kind of suggesting that no trial is necessary. But we all know that nobody can be condemned without a trial in our country because that's again a constitutional right. But with passage of time, six months later, eight months later, a year later, things would have changed. Some people might have said, well, they have done a terrible thing, but if they have children, if they have little children, if they have had very, very 
oppressed lives themselves, then we must mitigate the, the, the sanction and allow them to spend a life in prison, but not have to give up their life completely. Uh, it may change. Now, this is not what a judge's job is, to say, let's wait for six months and then we'll take an opinion again, and then wait for another six months and we'll take an opinion again. In fact, sometimes when the pressure is very heavy, judges often say, we will postpone this decision for a while simply because they want to give a clear impression that their decision is not based on the pressure, public pressure, and the pressure of public sentiment, but that it is completely independent of the position that they have taken. Therefore, go back into history. Now, there are two views there when you go back into history. History can make you captive, and a lot of people will say that you should not become captive of the past. If you become captive of the past, and the Supreme Court has said this many times over, then you cannot look forward. Then you cannot make your law progress. Then you cannot make yourself grow. Then you are static and you will never be able to, to reform yourself and you will never be able to grow and transform yourself into a new reality. Now, that, those arguments will have to be settled. But I believe that it is, it is very dangerous and uncertain to leave choice to the judges to say, this is what people want and therefore I will follow it. Because they may get the wrong impression about what the people want. They may be prejudiced themselves in being one of those people. After all, they also belong to our society. So what the trend is at a given time may well be a trend that they have themselves absorbed. But a judge sitting as a judge cannot decide a thing or a, a, a particular proposition because he personally feels this is something good or right. He has to look at what the law means and the law requires, and that can only be possible if you look at institutional morality rather than popular morality. And that institutional morality to be searched, to be established, to be discovered is not an easy job. Therefore, what does hard do? Uh, what does uh, Dworkin do? Dworkin says there are two kinds of judges. There is one judge who, when things run out, when the law as it's laid down in the books and in earlier judgments does not give a right answer, he relegates it to what he would have done if he was a parliamentarian. So that he will start filling the gaps that are left by parliament or gaps that are left by previous judges and fill them the way parliament would fill them. This is what a judge would do. And very mischievously, Tuokin calls such a judge by the name of Herbert. And that being the first name of Herbert Hart, H.L.A. Hart. It is mischievous, but it is, it is done in a friendly way. But the judge that Dworkin believes has to search for institutional morality is something quite different. And that judge is called Hercules. And that indicates that this is a very special kind of judge that is required. This is the judge that has to do something which is superhuman. That is something that may be very difficult to do. That is something that he does and he may get it wrong. But Dworkin's thesis says that the mere fact that you get something wrong doesn't mean that you shouldn't do it that way. And he gets inspiration from scientific investigation. There is, according to the theory of science, never a right answer. There is only a right answer in the present because scientific investigation requires observation and experiment. And at any given time, at any possible given time, you would come to, on the basis of evidence that is then available, a particular conclusion. But that conclusion can change when more information comes. So there is no right answer. Even in a hard case, there is no right answer because you may get another Hercules, Hercules II, who can investigate further, who has a, who has a mental capacity that is much greater, who has, uh, uh, who, who has spent longer years in researching, who's 
who is provided with assistance that the that Hercules one may not have been provided. Therefore, the best that you can say is that this is the best answer for the present. This is not the right answer. But the search and the constant attempt to find the right answer will get you to the best answer. If you give up the search for the right answer, then there will be no best answer. There will be an answer, but it will not be the best answer. It will be an answer that may be workable. It may be an answer that is very bad. It may be an answer that will lead you to, to the consequences that are unimaginable. But if you continue to search for the right answer, then you will also have, according to that thesis, you'll also have opportunity from time to time to correct the mistakes you have made. And therefore, when you study the trend, when you study the trend, you will make mistakes, which mistakes will then have to be weeded out. When uh, somebody was a little slow at understanding what Dworkin was saying, he used to often point to a painting on the wall and say, you see a painting on the wall? In that painting, there's a house, there's a brook, there's a stream, there is a horse, there are, there are one or two people, and there's a horse with a carriage going in a particular direction. Now, that painting is constrained and restricted by the frame of the painting. It is not a perennial painting, it's not a painting that goes on to, to infinity, it stops at a particular point. But if I were to ask you, what is there beyond the frame of the painting? Then how would you answer that question? Would you answer that question by going to the artist and saying, please tell me what is beyond that form, beyond the, the, uh, the four ends of the painting? And please tell me if the artist is available, the artist may not be available. And if the art is not available, then some critics, some critics of that, of that artist or some art critics who have written about that painting, who's talked about certain trends that you see in his various paintings. You study all those, you study the pattern, uh, you study the flow of the, of, the, uh, of the colors in this very painting. And then you come to a conclusion that the right answer, i.e. the best answer for what there would be beyond the the four corners of this painting is so and so and such and such. But that may well be different. That may well be different from what the, what the, what the artist himself had thought. But it would give you an internal consistency between the painting and what you assume is beyond the painting. And the search for what is beyond the painting and this exercise of learning about the artist, enough about the artist to be able to say, this is what the painting would look like is the job of a judge. And that's what I believe many judges unknowingly do. They do the exercise that Hercules does. They paint further that small painting. They expand that painting further. They give the same pattern of growth. Sometimes maybe a judge gets it wrong, in which case, a later generation judge would come and make the amends and say that was a mistake. The institutional integrity is, is intact. We will follow the institutional integrity. Now, there are questions that will arise, and maybe we'll talk about that another time. Is this too much backward looking? Is this too much uh, in, in, in terms of, of status quo? Is it too much? Uh, uh, is, it, it is, is it too much? of a constraint on being for a new world and responding to questions that arise and new things that have happened. But that's frankly for another lecture. For, for today, uh, I recommend to you uh, read something on Ronald Walken, a remarkable man. Uh, maybe one hour was not enough to understand uh, that unique mind. But you can look at uh, a book that I've done with Lukin Malik and uh, uh, Veronica Rodriguez, uh, Rod Rodriguez uh, on dignity, on dignity, uh, according to Ronald Joaquin. And uh, you find some very interesting, interesting documents, very interesting uh, articles here. I've tried to do something also along the lines that we've spoken about today. So thank you very much. I hope you, you enjoyed the uh, exposition on Ronald Joaquin. 
and uh, I hope to be back with you. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Uh, good evening, sir. Yep. So my question was regarding the Kishwan and the Bharti case. Yep. So the restriction which has been imposed by the Supreme Court upon the Parliament that the Parliament cannot amend the basic tenets of the Constitution. So, sir, this uh, imposition has been made by the Supreme Court only. So, sir, can this imposition be repealed by the Supreme Court by itself or can it be repealed by the President or it's uh, it's, invincible. it's very, 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 very interesting question. I think this question looms large over jurisprudence in our country. Uh, technically, technically, one answer would be uh, that uh, all you require is a larger bench, a larger bench to overrule Keshavan Bharti. Keshavan Bharti, as you know, was seven six. Um, it was uh, it, it was thirteen judges. Uh, it was seven six. A bare majority, bare majority of one that that held that holds Kishan and Bharti. But I think the generations of judges that have come uh, since then have accepted it. Uh, there was one attempt by forming a larger bench, I think of 15 or 16, uh, at one point that met for a day or two and then was disbanded. Uh, so technically, you might say that the Supreme Court can override uh, and overrule Kishan and Bharti, but uh, frankly. Uh, I think if you look at the the the, uh, the analytical analytical part of of Keshav um, Bharti, I think the Supreme Court has not created new law. Uh, Supreme Court has only put its finger on the inherent inherent quality of any concept. See, when you look at something, uh, uh, any you look at any word, any word. Uh, which says this is uh, a word like truth, right? Now, a word like truth, if you analyze it, something that is completely true would be truth. Something that is half truth, would that be truth or not be truth? Something that is false will certainly be false. But is half truth part of truth or not true? Now, many of the, the uh, explanations or expansions of truth would include Truth by silence. Uh, truth by by uh, vigorously, vigorously nodding. Truth by by uh, diplomatic, diplomatic acceptance and acquiescence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And therefore, you could expand on truth. But can somebody simply say, "I will give you a new definition of truth"? I believe that's not possible. That would not work. Not work. Uh, and I think the Supreme Court would also find itself in that bind that it can't say we will change the law which we, which, which we followed because we had no choice but to follow it. This is inherent in the constitution. If you change the constitution beyond the basic structure, then there is no constitution. Then there is another constitution. So there's constitution A1 or C1 and it is not the constitution C. Uh, so you have to go back now to, uh, to the German philosophers uh, and and uh, Kelsen's Grun norm. If society accepts the new constitution and the new Supreme Court judgment, then it becomes acceptable. But uh, it's almost like a revolutionary process by which some such fundamental change, even by that very court that that had given and pronounced the Krishna and Bharti judgment, to be done. Yes. Thank you, sir. Sir, sir, I have one technical uh, question with regard to the constitutionality of the flow tests which take place and many a time, sir, you have witnessed such uh, matters in the court as being the arguing counsel. And sir, what I uh, really feel is that the constitutional, uh, what are the constitutional mindset of the court at that time while deciding the governor's check basically, sir? Well, you know, there's a lot of law in this and a lot of sociology. Um, the, the law is as it's been laid down that in order to tell whether somebody has majority, uh, instead of parading people or taking affidavits, etc., let them come to the house and in the house let them say, uh, in whichever manner in the house it said, uh, let them say in the house that they support the particular uh, government or they don't support the particular government. So it's a practical solution that the judges judges have found, and in a sense they've said, look. 
as far as possible, just do it yourself, leave us out of it. And if you do it yourself, we'll accept whatever is the result, we will accept. Uh, so I think, I think that's possibly what they have done. But of course, uh, why should that be, why should that be done? Why should, why is it not done elsewhere in the world? Because there is uh, a fundamental trust and faith between constitutional uh, personalities that if the governor or person in the role of a governor says, I'm satisfied so-and-so has majority, um, the other institutions will accept it. They will not say, well, we're going to, we are, we are going to question this. We are going to question it. Uh, but unfortunately, the way our life, uh, national life has developed, the, the kind, of, kind of, of faith and trust there should be between constitutional people or constitutional offices has got somewhat, somewhat dented, if not eroded. And therefore, um, a path has been found by which you don't, uh, you don't become vulnerable to making a mistake about accepting or not accepting what somebody else is saying. And therefore, not only have you said, please go back to the floor and do it, but you've also said, make sure that this is, this is videographed. So that tomorrow we need, we need to check what happened, the videograph will be available to us. So I think this is just a passing phase in the life of our nation in which basic faith between, between, between constitutional institutions has got somewhat, somewhat diluted. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. I think, sir, uh, sir since there are no more questions, so, sir, yeah. we would like to thank you on behalf of lecture. Uh, is, there, is there any question somebody want to uh, ask? Please, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good evening, sir. Sir, is the Supreme Court is within their power when they decide any section or any act to be ultra uh, to the legislation? No, just say it again. I, the, the, the beginning of your question I lost. Sir, is the Supreme Court is uh, within their power to uh, decide any act or any section ultra-virus to the Constitution? Oh, yes, I mean, that, that is the fundamental power that the Supreme Court has. Supreme Court does a whole lot of other things as well. But uh, on deciding the virus of legislation, uh, virus in terms of the Constitution, either uh, uh, either uh, because the, the legislative power uh, is missing in because of the federal structure, state and state and center. Uh, is it a subject, subject on which the state can legislate or is it the subject on which the center can legislate? That's something that the court can find it, can look at. The court has also constantly said that we, we lean in favor of validity. If, because parliament has passed something, we favor looking at validity of what it's passed till it's shown to us that it is ultra virus. And then now, of course, the court has, has uh, included other things and it's an expansion of the ultra virus thesis. And that includes now proportionality and uh, purposeful action, et cetera, et cetera. So new concepts get added, get added on, but it's essentially basically does parliament have the right to do what the parliament has done. We want to examine it and examine it in terms of the constitution as, as we know the constitution from 1950, but also the constitution as we know it in terms of interpretation of the constitution by the Supreme Court itself. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for our landing us. So thank you so much for the today's lecture okay. and sir thank you so much for the, this unwavering attention through this lecture on this topic sir and we are also obliged on behalf of the entire lecture series on log team sir to enlighten us with the topic and answering the question at very rest in peace thank you so much sir for delivering this wonderful lecture to us thank you i enjoyed it thoroughly and uh, hope we'll meet again thank you so much sir thank you so much. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.